Good morning, Tulsa Bible Church, and welcome. My name is Jared. I'm the senior pastor here. If you don't mind finding your seats, we'll have just a few quick announcements, and then our, our service will start with worship music from Sam Kelly and our music team. Uh, if this is your first time here at Tulsa Bible Church, we want to especially welcome you. In the chair backs in front of you, you will find this visitor information card. If you don't mind, take a few seconds, fill that out, and place it in one of our two offering boxes that you'll see at the entrance to the sanctuary doors. When you came in, just drop that in when you leave, and we'll follow up with you in any way we can. At our welcome desk in the lobby, there's also green packets. Take one of those with you as you go. That'll give you just a little bit of information about our staff, some of the ministries we have here, a statement of faith, things that you would be interested in if you are considering Tulsa Bible Church as your next home church. And thanks again for being here. Just two quick announcements this morning. We have our Unity 9 coming up next Sunday on July 26th. What that means is the 9 a.m. hour that we usually reserve for flock groups and Sunday school classes. We will be meeting in here in the sanctuary to talk about the vision for our church, where we're going. You'll be have a chance to listen to our elders and the leadership and just be updated about the current happenings at TBC. We want to encourage you to come to that. Following that morning session at 6 p.m. in the evening, Tom Woody, our church treasurer, will be updating us on the business happenings of TBC. You'll get a budget update and many other things concerning our building and, and just the, the financial side, the administrative side of ministry at Tulsa Bible Church. If you have any questions, you can talk to Tom Woody about that. If you cannot make it to either the 9 a.m. Unity 9 session or the Sunday evening business meeting, we will be recording those sessions on DVD. Call the church, make a request for a DVD, and we would love to provide that for you. Lastly, on August 7th through 9th is going to be our summer youth retreat. Daniel Newberry and the youth volunteers are going to lead a, an awesome retreat out at New Life Ranch, the Frontier Cove branch of New Life Ranch. It's going to be a wonderful retreat. If you would like to sign your children up, this is for middle school and high school kids. If you want to sign them up, you can go on the website find the registration there, fill it all out. If you have any questions regarding that, talk to Mark Shue, Joe Shoup, or Daniel Newberry in the, youth, um, in the youth ministry, and we would love to answer those questions for you. Thanks again for being here. We hope that this time of worship leads you closer and closer to the person of Christ, and your understanding of the gospel is enriched through our ministries right here today at Tulsa Bible Church. Good morning, TBC. We've got a great opportunity this morning to celebrate one of the two ordinances that God has given us to us in his word to remember and to symbolize the truth of the gospel. So this morning I've got two very excited boys here that are ready to be baptized. Uh, Sterling and Hunter are going to be baptized today. And just before we do this, I want to talk a little bit about the truth of baptism and what baptism really means for us as a community and as a church. The Greek word for baptize is baptizo. It sounds almost exactly like our English word for baptism. And it literally means to immerse. So when we baptize believers in the body of Christ, we immerse them, we dip them into a new identity that is found in Christ and in the gospel. The word itself comes from the first century where they used to take cloth materials and dye them to be a different color. You would take a, a piece of cloth and merchants that would want to sell them would completely immerse the cloth in a dye that would change its identity. And so baptism is something that, that roots us in an identity in the gospel that changes us in our identity and symbolizes what God has done for us through the gospel in Christ. Just as Jesus died and was buried and he rose again to everlasting life in baptism, we we symbolize a person dies to their sin and rises again to everlasting life to a new identity in Christ. And I'm extremely, extremely happy that we can do this with two of our, two of our young guys in the body of Christ. This is a great testimony to our parents. After these guys are baptized, we're going to have another video. They're going to share their testimony a little bit, and so you can watch that and, and be a part of it as well. So first I'm going to ask Sterling Shacker to come on down, and he's going to be our first, first boy to be baptized this morning. brother in Christ, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, 
Next we have Hunter Elledge, who's going to come down here. Hunter, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and him alone for your salvation, as a brother in Christ, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let me pray for us as we start this morning. Father in heaven, I thank you for Hunter and for Sterling. I thank you for their families. Um, I thank you that these two boys have committed themselves, have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and are taking the step of obedience, uh, not in order to be saved, but because they are saved. And they want to show their, themselves and their life as an example of what it means to walk with you and to be a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for, for their parents. I thank you for their Sunday school teachers and their Rwanda leaders who have invested so much time into them and in helping them take this step of obedience in their, in their walk with you. I pray that you would help them stand firm in the days and the years to come as our country gets more and more isolated from you and our culture gets more secular. Uh, strengthen them and give them courage in the faith that they so desperately need. We pray that you would encourage them, their families, and that our church family would be encouraged by their testimony today. And it's in the name of your Son and by your Spirit we pray. Amen. to the fatherless defender of the weak and freedom for the prisoner we sing this is God in his holy place this is God
children, you are now dismissed to Children's Church. Good morning, church. You know why I say that? About 12 years ago, I went to Kenya for the first time, and I went to uh, church with Marlene's twin brother and his wife, who are our guests with us here today, Marvin Jan Smith. They uh, served as missionaries there for 35 plus years. And every church service we went to, everyone that came to the platform would say, good morning, church. And the people would respond with, Good morning. And uh, I love that because it seemed like they were engaged. They were excited. They were like the church in Acts, that they were glad to be there. And their churches were thriving and growing. Today, I think, is a very special service for us that we had today in, in response to the great commandment. To go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to teach them to obey my commandments. And lo, I'm with you always. And so I'm sorry the parents stepped out, but I would like the parents of Hunter and uh, Sterling to stand up, the grandparents. Would you guys mind standing up for us? So some of you that may not know them as a family, grandparents, I'm assuming, parents. And I think the others kind of walked out. Who has actually taught Hunter in Sunday school or in uh, also in Awana or any, and, and uh, Sterling. If you've done that, would you please stand? You know, Scripture says, thank you. Thank you. That's an awesome thing, an awesome responsibility you have to teach and to train up your grandchild and your children and to teach those students that are under your care. And I am so thankful that we have a church here that teaches up children the word of God and so we need to be praying for these boys that their grandparents their parents their friends their teachers would train them up in the way to go this is an awesome service we have today and I thank you for coming and being a part of that with us have a seat Maddie thank you for a great introduction to why this is such a special service let me uh, read a passage for today This passage comes out of Psalms 121, verses 1 and 2. And it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would help us to look up. Look up because we know where our help comes from. Father, these hills and these valleys that we are going through, they may seem very large. And especially as we look at our world, the sickness in our world, the politics, the hatred, and all of the sin. Father, I pray that you would help us to remember that our help comes from the one that created the hills and the valleys, the mountains, the seas, the rivers, and the whole universe. Lord, may we just as a psalmist express our complete reliance upon the maker of the heavens and the earth, the creator of all things, the God of wisdom, the providential God, the good God, the infinite God. Father, we thank you that you are a great Savior, that you are sovereign in all the universe and that you personally know each one of us. You know Hunter and you know Sterling and you know each one in this room personally. And Father, you provide security to your saints. Lord, we can trust you no matter what valleys, no matter what hills we go through. We can trust you, God, as our helper to protect us each and every day in our comings and our goings. Lord, we know that you will help us not only today, but forevermore. That you have helped us from our youth 
to your old age and beyond. God, we thank you for being spirit. For there is no one like you, God. You are immeasurable. God, we just thank you that, that you love us so much. And Lord, we believe that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. It is a gift from Christ. And we as believers are filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Lord, the Holy Spirit teaches us through your indwelling. Father, I pray that we would earnestly seek the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we need it for salvation. We need it for the temptations that we face, the sin that we engage in. We need it for transformation in our lives. We need it, Lord, for witnessing. Lord, we need it for understanding of the word of God. Lord, we need it for a fruitful life. We need it for comfort, and we need it for holiness. Lord, we need it for love for other people. We need it for truth, and we need it for grace. Father God, we have many here today that may have needs, and Lord, you know each and every one of their needs. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would pour themselves out into them today, that they would sense your presence, that they would know that you are the helper, the provider that we need so desperately. Father, we thank you for our missionaries throughout the world. We thank you for the Flynn's that uh, serve with the gospel mobilization ministry that are normally in Peru, that are our missionary of the week, that are back in Arkansas now, and how they are learning to minister to people more effectively through the virtual way of ministering and how they're, that you're using that to touch lives. Lord, we thank you for our missionaries in Lisbon, for the Schatzmans, for the Mike and Suzanne, and for their kiddos as they seek to trust you to provide for their needs, and they have some big needs there. They've been struggling with some things, and I pray that you would help them. Or especially want to lift up to the, the Powell's. The Powell's are preparing in the next couple of weeks to come back to America. And Lord, for travel mercy, for, for, for uh, connections, for just preparation as they come back to the States and, and to bring their children with them. And Father, I just pray that you would go before them, prepare their way, that they would see your hand in all this. They see that you are the great helper, the provider for their needs. Father, I pray for Kyle and Vanessa and Hudson, Jude, Isaac, and Ariella, that you would bless them in their ministry in Kenya, that you would use them there, that you would continue to reach the people for the gospel in that community. Father, we just thank you for others in this congregation right here that are missionaries in our community. Lord, we need your help. We know that you're available. We know that you are right here with us, that your word of God says that you are inside of us and you go wherever we go, and we thank you for that. Father, now I just ask that we, as we turn to the word of God, that you will open our hearts and our minds to see and hear mighty things from your word. Bless our service today, and bless Jared as he opens the word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Travis. If you guys have your Bibles, I hope you do. Turn to John chapter 1 this morning. John chapter 1, and if, if you listen closely to Travis's prayer, uh, praying for help from God, that God is our helper, that's our attribute of God that we are praying through on our monthly prayer calendar. I want to encourage you, if you haven't grabbed one of those, they're in the, in the foyer on the welcome desk. You can take one of those with you. And continue to pray with TBC in unity as we think about the character of God through this study and pray together for God to do what only God can do in his hearts and in the life of our church family here. Also, the last song that Sam and Brandon and Christian uh, sang up here this morning, leading us in worship, was a, just a, a really great old hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And it talks about the blessed Trinity in there. And, and the whole, whole song is formatted around the truth of the Trinity that we see in Scripture. And that God is a holy trinity. This morning, what we're going to do is talk about the trinity from John chapter 1 in just the first five verses. And it's, it's interesting because the trinity is it's that word that you're not going to see in Scripture if you look for it. Uh, but it's a truth of, of Christian doctrine, of orthodox Christian teaching that we believe and we hold to. 
and so I want to talk about it today as we, as we continue in our sermon series on the character of God. So when I was a believer at Mississippi State, a lot of you guys know my story. I trusted Christ as a freshman in college, and, and immediately God gave me amazing mentors, uh, pastors, disciplers that took the time, invested into me, and taught me the foundational truths of the faith of Christianity, and probably some of the most um, fire hose, drinking it in theology, Bible study time that I've ever had in my entire life, and I'm so grateful that, that God was gracious to me as a Timothy to give me a Paul, or as a Titus to give me a Paul, and if I look back on those years, about six years at Mississippi State in Starkville, Mississippi, the one thing that I would say I learned more about was how to study Scripture, how we can learn from Scripture, the tools that I need to, to interpret Scripture, to apply it to my life, and, and ultimately, my mentors came alongside and they taught me just how to grow closer to God through a relationship with His Word. Now, you can imagine my disgust when I entered at Dallas Theological Seminary, a master's degree to learn more about Scripture and more about God, when I had to take classes that were distinctly not Bible classes, right? Two of them at the forefront were Church History I and Church History II. And I thought to myself, why in the world have I come to Dallas Seminary, to a biblical institution, to learn something that's not distinctly biblical? On the very, very first day of my very first church history class that I was angry that I had to attend, and I was upset that they made me do these things, some of you guys Young guys, you need to go to college and just take classes that you don't want to take and go through school. It's a learning process. It's, it's there for a reason, okay? So just, just do it. It develops character and strength in you, all right? That's just free side note. Church history, for very first class, Dr. Beam, Bingham opens up and he says this. He says, guys, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the things that I'm about to teach you in one semester of church history that you've probably not heard a lot of them before. I'm sorry that your churches aren't teaching you a little bit more about church history and about the faith that has been once and for all handed down to the saints through the apostles and the prophets, Jude 3. I'm sorry that you probably haven't learned this in your church and that you had to come to seminary to get this material but we're gonna plow into this material. I'm sorry that you don't know how the canon of the Bible was established through church history. And apart from the men of faith that God used to solidify the 66 books of scripture that we know as the Protestant canon of scripture, we would, we would not have it apart from church history. I'm sorry that the, the deity of Christ would probably still be argued that the doctrine of the Trinity might still be in question if it wasn't for church history. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time y'all heard a sermon on the Trinity? Just, just one sermon. Today we're gonna talk about the Trinity. First slide here, Amos, for some reason my clicker's not engaging, thanks. When's the last time that somebody just we, the seminary professor that I had, he said, everybody raise your hands if you have never heard a sermon just distinctly on the doctrine of the Trinity. Over half the class raised their hand. They've never, never, ever heard that before. And so, so what I've done here at TBC is I've, I've taken church history, the, the orthodox teaching of the faith that's been passed down to us, how it's been passed down to us, and every year at the time of the Reformation, October 31st, that we celebrate it, we talk about church history. I'll take two or three weeks again this year and talk about church history as it applies to scripture. We, ju we just baptized two boys in this congregation in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's a baptismal formula, comes from the Gospel of Matthew that has been used throughout church history. And here's what church history tells us about the Trinity. The Trinity was, is a doctrine that has developed mostly out of the heretical teaching that was existing at the time when they were formulating the doctrine. And the Trinity comes to us through four ecumenical councils. The first ecumenical council is the Council of Nicaea. This is something that we quote often here at Tulsa Bible Church. 
as, as times of taking the Lord's Supper, of welcoming new members in the church, the Council of Nicaea is one of the universal creeds that is established, that is agreed upon across denominations in evangelical traditions of the faith. And the, the, her, the heretical teaching that the Nicene Creed addresses in A.D. 325 was that of Arianism. Arius was a a Christian teacher, a a bishop of Alexandria in Egypt at the time, and Arius believed that there was a time when the Son of God did not exist, that the Son was begotten of the Father, so in time there there was actually a time that existed before the eternal Son of God came into existence. He emphasized the distinction of the Son over the Father instead of the Son having one essence with the Father. And then a response to that, of course, that heretical teaching was the Nicene Creed. The second council, ecumenical council, was the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and it addressed the heresies of Apollinarianism and Sabellianism. And Sabellianism teaches that God existed in three different modes at different times and different periods throughout history. You might have heard of this as modalism, There's a dynamic modalism that exists even today in the church that we have to address as a heretical teaching. Sabellianism emphasized that God is one, but that he appears in one mode at one particular time in history. So when God is one as the Son, he is not at the same time this one as the Spirit, he is not at the same time the Father. There's actually the Son that exists in isolation from the Father and from the Spirit and on through through the other persons of the Trinity. In other words, the Father, Son, and Spirit are not co-eternal. They are not of one essence. This is going to be very academic this morning on the Trinity, all right? The response to the the, um, Sabellianism and the heretical teaching of this time, Apollinarianism, was an amendment to the Nicene Creed. We call it the Nicene-Constantinople Creed of 381 AD. They just modified, they added more material to establish the deity of the Son and his coexistence, his eternal coexistence with the Father and with the Spirit. The third council that the church argued through and and came up to the, the doctrine, the orthodox teaching of the Trinity is called the Council of Ephesus. And it existed, it came out with its teaching in 431 A.D., about 50 years after the Constantinople edition, the amendment to the Nicene Creed. And it addressed the heresies of Nestorianism and even Pelagianism. Nestorian was a heretical teacher who separated the deity of Christ from the humanity of Christ. He argued that Christ was fully human, but he wasn't fully God. He didn't exactly embrace his full deity until he was some kind of way mysteriously adopted into his deity with the Father. And it got into another heretical teaching of adoptionism in the church. The fourth ecumenical council that established the orthodox teaching of the Trinity is the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. And Chalcedon came up with a definition that established for good, definitively clarifying the hypostatic union of Christ, that he is 100% God and he is 100% man. He is fully God, he is fully man, and these two natures of Christ come together in a mysterious, what they call it, a hypostatic union. And so we can't talk about Christ just in his humanity apart from his deity. You can't talk about his deity apart from his humanity. The two come together, the essential natures of Christ, this hypostatic union. He is complete in Godhood. He is complete in manhood. He is fully God. He is fully man. Do you know anybody today that, that would suggest that Jesus is just a good moral teacher? He's a good prophet. Had a lot of great things to say. Compare him with all the other great human moral teachers in history. The doctrine of the, of the Trinity is studied alongside the deity of Christ when you plunge into this doctrine, into this theology. But some have problems when studying the Trinity, and here's just a few. Number one, it's the one that I just mentioned to you, is the Bible problem. The Bible problem is, is just simply this. The word Trinity isn't in the Bible. 
you're not going to find it. It's not explicit in the Word of God. Uh, Erickson says this. It says, the Bible does not explicitly teach the Trinitarian view of God. I would say the Trinity is not explicit in the Bible. And it means that the word Trinity is not found. It is, it is implicit in its teaching. It is not explicit. So TBC is a Bible church, Tulsa Bible Church. Why are we talking about a word that is not in the Bible? Because it is the orthodox teaching of the faith that has been passed down to us from church history, clarifying who Jesus is, who the Father is, who the Son is. But it's not in the Bible. Number two is the logical problem. The doctrine of the Trinity suggests that God is three, yet he is also one. So one of the the mathematicians of of theology and church history have, have argued that when you talk about God, one plus one plus one equals one. Right? R.C. Sproul says that is not only bad arithmetic, but that is ghastly theology. That's not how the doctrine of the Trinity works. He is one in his essence. He is three in his persons. It is a mystery beyond all mysteries. The third problem that we have is the emphasis problem. Right? Most, most Reformed traditions Um, more highly reformed churches, they are going to emphasize the fatherhood of God. God is sovereign. He is in control. He is omnipotent. He is king. Over and against, say, like a a Puritan or a pietist position, they're going to emphasize the son of God, not the father, but the son, in a Christocentric reading of Scripture, which is very biblical to do that. Jesus talked about that. Versus maybe a a charismatic or a Pentecostal church that emphasizes the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And so what do we do? Is there one person that we should emphasize over all the rest? When we sing, holy, 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 God in three persons, blessed Trinity, is that that what we should be singing in the church? Is that part of the orthodox teaching of the faith? You've got a a Bible problem, you've got a logical problem, you've got an emphasis problem. So let me repeat this statement from Evelyn Underhill that we talked about last week. If God were small enough to be understood, he wouldn't be big enough to be worshipped. If God is small enough to be understood completely in his Trinitarian nature, he wouldn't be big enough to be worshipped. So a lot of the the text that we're coming down to here is, is Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret and the deep things belong to God. They are, they are too deep for us to understand. When we tread down this path of, of Trinitarian theology, we are, um, are immediately confronted with a mysterious, infinite, incomprehensible God. And all of us in humility say, I don't get it. The egg illustration doesn't work. The light illustration, different particles, three things, it's the same thing, it doesn't work. The water illustration, it doesn't work. Ice, water, gas, vapor, whatever. None of those things are, are directly applicable to the nature of the Trinity. God is so distinctly other than anything that we can use to explain him. So with the Apostle Paul in Romans 11, verse 33, we just say, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable are his ways. We enter into the doctrine of the Trinity. What I'm going to ask us all to do as Tulsa Bible Church Christians who know your text so well is to enter in with a little humility and acknowledge the fact that there is so much of this that we can never, ever comprehend on this side of glory. But that should draw us to worship God even more, not less and pursue him with a greater passion, not a weaker one. Turn to John chapter 1, and I'm going to read the first five verses as an exposition of the Trinity. All right. John 1 verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
By the way, R.C. Sproul did a, a really great sermon on the Trinity on YouTube. You can find it. It's called The Doctrine of the Trinity. He uses this passage to explain it. It's good, so I recommend it to you. John is the one gospel writer of the four that emphasizes the Trinity, the Trinitarian nature of God more than any other gospel writers. John talks about the Spirit, the Comforter, who will come. In the Gospel of John, we see the Father who sends the Son, the Son who saves humanity, and the Son and the Father who send the Spirit into the world to indwell believers and to baptize them, to identify them with Christ. It has more verses that allude to the Trinity than any other verse, and right in the beginning, we're going to see that. The first three words in John 1, verse 1, in the beginning. What does that sound like in your Bible? Genesis. Thank you. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created, right? But, but not so fast. Is John using that word beginning the same way that we would say Moses used it in Genesis chapter 1? The Greek word for beginning is pronounced arche. We know it from, uh, from words like arch, archaeology, and ark. It's really interesting. Arche can mean at least three things in Greek. It can mean beginning of an action, it can mean the first cause, or it can mean number three, a really distinct word that uses arche is ruler. So we know this from our English word arch, archbishop. Or maybe you have an arch nemesis, right? This is, the, this is a person who has more, is higher and more powerful than any other person who he's associated with. A shortened form of that Greek word arche, arch in English, is ark. So we often talk about like an archangel. That's an angel that is higher and more powerful than the other angels. In terms of kingdoms, you could talk about, talk about arc or arch in many ways. We are, um, many civilizations began to be ruled by a monarchy. That's the, that's the same arc is used to establish. A monarchy is the rule of one over a group of people, over a, a civilization or a people group. So is John saying in the beginning in reference to time, maybe like Genesis would be saying, redemptive history, or is he saying in the beginning in reference to the one ruler, the one who is higher, the one sovereign God, or is, or is John talking about both those things at the very same time? What makes it even harder to answer that question is early Greek philosophy. We read in, in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and that Greek word for word, you're going to know this one as well, logos or logos. Early Greek philosophers studied rationality, reason, and knowledge probably more than any other group of people throughout human history. Uh, Early Greek civilizations thought that there were many gods and goddesses, and we hear about them through the Greek myths that have come about through time to explain certain things in life and and why certain things happen, right? Right? The, the ancient Greek philosophers looked at those myths and they said, you know what, what if, what if there really isn't these myths and these gods and these goddesses behind everything? What if there's just, just one thing, one principle of life, one rational thought, one idea? And they called that the logos or the logos. Philosophers came along and, and they shifted myth to logos or myth to reason and to knowledge When they looked to nature, they saw that things were constantly changing in nature, and yet they also saw a world that was ordered and structured with repeated and and laws of nature and principles in nature. And they argued that there had to be something behind the universe. There had to be one thing that could even explain it or maybe even brought it into existence, and their answer was, that is the logos. John says, in the beginning was the logos. And that would have got every Greek philosopher's attention when he said that. Until he gets down to verse 14. Skip down to verse 14. And the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John's logos was different than a principle, an idea, a philosophy, intellect, knowledge, or reason, or, or anything like that. John's logos was a person, and that person was Jesus Christ. The Old Testament if we wanted to, to dig in and, and to find out what it thinks about John chapter 1, the Old Testament has always believed in one God. It has, it has promoted a monotheism that is different than a lot of ancient Near Eastern religions and traditions. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the, the Hebrew Shema, Hear, O oh hear, Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord alone, or the Lord is, is one. So when Jesus comes on the scene, and he declares that I am, over and over again, I am, I am, I am. He is associating himself with the one true God that has been proclaimed throughout the Old Testament. Before Abraham was, I am. And you can understand why his, his listeners and the religious leaders had such a hard time with that. The God that they were expecting wasn't going to come in, in humble human form like Jesus did. It was going to be an all-powerful God, maybe even more like the ancient Greek philosophers thought. Genesis 1 really doesn't seem to be behind this text anymore in John chapter 1. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning God created. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? But, but the Lagos, the sovereign ruler, might also fit John's description of, of Jesus and who he was. So here's, here's how John goes on to explain it. He says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And if you have a, a highlighter or a Bible, if you underline things in your Bible, put a circle or a line under that Greek preposition with, English preposition with. With is a uh, in the, in the Greek, prepositions can have so many different meanings. You kind of throw a whole lot of words at them until it fits your English translation. Most of the time in Greek, with is a small little Greek word that's pronounced para. And para can mean many different things. Primarily, it means for, at, to, or toward. Typically, when you see with in the Bible, it's going to mean for, at, to, or toward. And usually it indicates proximity or closeness to something. The Lagos was with God. For instance, um, we see this in our English, if you've ever heard of a, a paralegal. This is a legal representative that comes alongside in close proximity with other legal um, workers. You, in the church, we hear about parachurch ministries. These are ministries that come alongside. They work with the church. And it would make sense if with, para, was the Greek preposition used in this text, but it's not. Here the preposition is not para, it's, it's pronounced pros. And pros is a Greek word that means something a little bit different than para. Pros is a Greek preposition means, um, it has an idea of a prosopon or a, a face. So when we read the word was with God, we might say the word was face to face with God. It expresses a, the closest type of relationship, not just an association, not just proximity, but the closest of proximities. You are pretty close with a person if you stand side beside them. This word, this preposition in the Greek means face to face in even closer proximity. So now listen, if, if Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God, and if John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, we would think that there's two entities mentioned that have to do with God. You've got the Word, and then you've got God. Two distinct entities are being mentioned. Two maybe uh, beings are even being mentioned. R.C. Sproul says this, everything explodes with this next assert assertion in John's prologue. We read about it again in verse 1 and the Word was God. This, is, this means is that the one who was face-to-face -face with God, the one who has the closest proximity with God, the Lagos who is at the beginning with God, was truly God. He was fully God, and he was full deity. 
The NET Bible actually translates this at the end of verse 1. The word was fully God. And you can see how this became really confusing for the early church, and you can see how these heretical teachings about Jesus and about the character of God emerged, right? If you're reading some of these these verses and you're just taking it at, at face value, it seems to be that there are separate entities with God, but there's one essence with God. How do we make sense of it? How do we make sense of the three in one nature of God? Jesus affirms the oneness of God over and over in the Gospel of John. John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. John 14 says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. John 17, verse 11, Jesus prays for his disciples to the Father so that they may be one just as we, speaking of the Father and the Son, are one. Just like the Jews had a very distinct belief in a monotheistic creator God, John talks about creation at the beginning. Skip down to uh, verse 2. It says, he, speaking of the Logos, speaking of Christ, was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. That's a distinct reference to creation. All things were made through him, and without him, not anything was made that was made. Then verse 4 it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus, uh, John gives one of his, his favorite terms throughout all of the Gospel of John, which is life. 37 times you're going to read that, that word, life, in the Gospel of John. 14 of those 37 times it is prefaced by the word eternal life. John is consumed with life. He is consumed with eternal life, especially as it appeals to the person and the work of Jesus. Once you get to John chapter 1, verse 5, Amos, next slide for me. Things shift in verse 5. John chapter 1, verse 5. Look at verse 5. Let me read this really slowly. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, let me ask you a question. What tenses have all of the verbs been in John 1, verse 1 through 4? so far? Past, present, or future? Past tense verbs. What are the tenses of the verbs in verse 5? Present tense verbs. Something is dramatically shifting here in the text. And as listeners, as they're hearing John, as they're maybe even reading this letter being circulated, they would have seen that, they would have known that. John is saying that the word is an ever-present light, that the light of God continues to shine. It is shining, it has been shining, and it will continue to shine. It also mentions a comparison. Another one of God's, uh, John's great comparisons throughout all of his writings, and that's the comparison of light and darkness. At the end of verse 5, it says this, the darkness has not overcome it, referring to the light. And again, just like some of these prepositions and words are hard to translate, Overcome is a very difficult word to translate in the Greek New Testament. One possible meaning is that to overcome something means to seize or to grasp it. In the middle voice, someone can grasp information, and we would say they understand it, right? So, so in this context, verse 5, we would say that the darkness does not understand, it does not grasp the light, And this would make sense, right? People who are walking in darkness, they don't understand the light. What is it? How do we make sense of this? They're um, sold as slaves into sin, and in darkness, they're walking in darkness, and so they don't understand the concept of even what it means to walk in the light. I want you to listen to what the NET Bible notes on this verse, speaking of overcome. It says, the Gospel of John rarely talks about darkness, overcome the darkness, really talks about darkness in terms of people. It almost always talks about darkness in terms of an environment. So darkness in the Bible is, is not just something that people experience apart from Christ. Darkness is a, it's a realm. Darkness is a kingdom. Darkness is a world in which people will find themselves apart from God. 
John 3, 19 says the people loved the darkness, loved it instead of the light. John 8, verse 12, those who follow Jesus do not walk in darkness, they walk in the light. John 12, 35, walk in the light lest the darkness overcome you. So in John chapter 1, verse 5, darkness cannot seize or take the light. It cannot understand it. It cannot grasp it. It cannot be overcome by it. And if John is using darkness in terms of a realm or in terms of a kingdom, here's what it means. The kingdom of darkness cannot master the kingdom of light. The kingdom of darkness cannot seize the kingdom of light. It cannot take it for itself. The Lagos, the Word of God, the one who is God, who was with God from the very beginning, who always is with God, who has always been with God, the one who is Christ, the one who is the light to all men, bringing salvation to all men, enters into a world, into an environment of darkness. Jesus Christ was born as a man, and he comes into a kingdom of darkness, the fallen world that we know. And here's what it says right at the beginning of the gospel, right at the outset, so that you know what Jesus is about to do and about his ministry. It says that the darkness cannot take the light. It cannot overcome it. It cannot seize it in any way. The kingdom of light is greater than the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of God's Son is stronger and more superior than the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of darkness. Colossians 1 talks about that we have redemption in his Son, who has delivered us from the kingdom, from the domain of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of light through Jesus' ministry. So here's what this means. In order to understand who Jesus is, the deity of Jesus, what we're going to say from John chapter 1 is at least this. That Jesus represents not only God, who he is in his essential nature, but he represents a king in a kingdom. And he has come into a kingdom of darkness that is against him, led by Satan and evil and wickedness and sin, And he is going to overcome that kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light in the ministry of Christ. And so in order to understand who Jesus is, in order to understand the Trinity, we understand God as light. God is a a king who is coming to establish his kingdom. We also come to understand that if that's true, the world in which we live is full of darkness and sin. This is a realm and a kingdom. And the only way that we're going to be delivered from that kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son is through Jesus. And we have to acknowledge that in our sin, we are captured and enslaved in a kingdom of darkness. And it's only through Jesus' power on the cross we repent, confess our sins, and believe in Jesus Christ. The darkness will not overcome the light. Sin is not stronger than the light of Christ. The kingdom of Christ is stronger than the kingdom of Satan in darkness. And this is the gospel. This is what the Trinity stands for. This is who he is, right? So let me just give you a a, a few basic principles of the Trinity in theology as we close. These are just uh, five very short things as as we apply this passage. When you think about the Trinity and the the theology of the Trinity, the unity of God is basic. The unity of God is basic. He is three distinct persons, Father, Son, Spirit. The three are unified into one, into the essence of God. God is one. God is not several. We still serve and we worship a monotheistic religion and one God who is Jesus manifested in three persons. Number two, each of the three persons are divine. Each of the three persons are divine. They are deity, and they, therefore they are worthy of our worship. Each person of the Trinity, whose divinity is solidified, is worshiped as divine. Now, the person of the Trinity who's been questioned the most in terms of their deity is Jesus. The person of the Trinity whose deity has been the most ignored throughout church history is the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is worshipped just as the Father and the Son is worshipped because they are one. They are of essence the same nature. Number three, in the Trinity we, do, we see a distinction of the three persons but one essence. A distinction of the three persons and yet there is one essence. There seems to be a contradiction when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity. There's three and yet there's one. It's not a contradiction. This is a great mystery. One plus one plus one does not equal one. It equals three. The three are still one in Christ. Number four, the Trinity is eternal. There has never been a time that the Son was not and the Father was. There's never been a time that the Spirit and the Son were not and only the Father was. There's never been a time that the Son was and the Father was not or the Spirit was not. All three have coexisted in Trinitarian nature from eternity. The Baptists got it wrong. 1963, the Baptist faith and message was amended to include that the Trinity eternally exists. They added the word triune when they talked about the eternal nature of God. They modified the version in the year 2000. All right. Number five, the function of the one member of the Trinity may for a time manifest subordination and submission, but that does not threaten the equality of the three persons of the Trinity. Okay, so we would say that the Son submitted his will to the Father. It doesn't mean that the, the Son is less inferior or the Father is more superior to the Son because the Son was submitting to him. Or if the Spirit submits to the Son and to the Father, it doesn't mean that the Spirit is more inferior than the Father is. All of them are equal in nature. All of them have one in their essence and they are one unity, and so, so we don't even go there. But let me end on this one, and we'll close. The Trinity shows us, and I think this is extremely important for us to, to think about, the Trinity shows us how to love one another in the body of Christ. The Trinity is our example of fellowship and community in the church. If you, any, any person at any given moment in time can live your life in two different ways anytime, based on the choices that are before you. Number one, you can live your life based on your wants, your desires, your own happiness, and your feelings. Or, you can choose to live your life where you are not the center of everything. You can choose to live your life based on truth. Anything that happens to you, you have a choice to, to live based on your feelings, or based on the truth. At any given moment, the decisions that you make will determine if you're living based on truth or based on feelings. The person who lives based on their feelings has their self, self, at the center of their life. Every person, every relationship that they have in their life is a means to an end. And here's what that end is. What I want, what I desire what I wish from this situation, my interests, what can you do for me? What have you done for me lately? Very little healthy relationships that a person can have when they live their life with themselves and their feelings at the center. The Trinity is drastically different. The Trinity shows us a God who is ultimately truth. And it is characterized by um, a selfless, self-giving love. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each person of the Trinity does not insist that the others around them do what they want them to do. Rather, they center on one another. They center on the other. So in Trinity, God is, is one who serves one another. They glorify one another. They put the interests of the others ahead of themselves. If the word was made, if the world was made, excuse me, by a triune God, then relationships of love is what this world is all about. If the world is a, a product of evolutionary processes, a collision of atoms, Big Bang, 
just a random chemical reaction, then love is, is simply, it's, love is a chemical, chemical thing that happens in your, in your mind, in your brain, in your heart. But if the world was made by a triune God, then relationships of love is what this world is all about. It's what everything ultimately comes down to. If it was created by a triune God, then selfless love is what the universe is all about. This is why 1 John tells us that God is love. And he first loved us so that we can love one another. God has eternally existed as a trinity. And each person of the trinity selflessly loves to the effect that no matter the cost to them, no matter the surrender that they have to give, they are going to live for the interest of the other. In the body of Christ, if that kind of divine love would come into any church, in any congregation, it would be drastically different. We wouldn't think about what we want. We wouldn't think about our own interests. We wouldn't be at the center. God would be at the center. Everything would revolve around him and around one another. Travis talked about the greatest commandment, uh, love God and loving one another, the greatest commandment. And it leads us to the great commission to make disciples. That's how we do it. That's how we're going to love one another into the kingdom, sharing the gospel of Christ. All right. This is the, uh, this is the final sermon that we're going to talk about for the character of God. Uh, when we come back next week, July 26th, we'll have our Unity 9 session. I'm going I'm to preach about our identity at Tulsa Bible Church and the core aspects of who God calls us to be at a ch- as our church. And love is a central, central component of that with our relationships in the body. So I want to encourage you to come back for that. In August, as we start, we've got youth retreat coming up. Uh, we've got Scott Susong is going to come in preach a little bit here as well. And so I want you to be, uh, be prepared and looking for that as well. Let me pray as we close. And if you guys have a chance before you leave, uh, come up to these guys that have been baptized this morning and and, uh, give them some congratulations for doing that. Father in heaven, you are Trinity, and um, it is so hard to understand exactly how that functions, what that means for us. There's a great mystery of your essence and your character in Trinity, but we know it's true from Scripture. We thank you for church history, for the faithful men and women, godly men and women, moved by your Holy Spirit who have taken the time to pass down the orthodox teaching of the faith for us. We take hope and comfort that we can now pass that on to those after us by discipling them. Lord, I pray that um, the relationships at Tulsa Bible Church would be definitely and practically and obviously molded by the love of God that we see in the Trinity. Help us to, uh, to give over to the preferences of other people. Help us to honor one another, to outdo one another in honor. Help the love that you have because of your essential nature as Trinity to permeate through this body and to transform our relationships in this church right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Father, we ask this to you through the Son and by the Spirit, for you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen. Amen. Sorry about that being a little bit more academic today. Uh, it's not customary for me, but I uh, really do encourage you to continue exploring the character of God and understanding his essential nature and his essential character. Have a great Sunday. Please, uh, we ask that you would uh, have the masks on as you come and go this morning, and thanks for being respectful of that and others around you and loving others through that action. And hopefully we'll see you guys next week.